Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. In a very short while, you will realize you made a terrible mistake just now. <laughs> My name is John Ackerman, and I'm an alcoholic. I am very enthusiastic about this program. I'm very grateful for this way of life. It's terrific. I uh, first like to thank the committee for the invitation. I'd uh, like to thank Steve for picking us up and making us feel at home right away. And uh, it is really like coming home here. It's, uh, and it's an amazing thing. It's, uh, I'm not the slightest nervous. <laughs> I, I, but I d am overwhelmed. You know the implication where you and I would be if it wasn't for this. It's really something. I uh, have a lot of friends in this room that I love very much. I've shown so many of you have never seen me before, but in a very short while you will know me very intimately. <laughs> 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 and uh, it is just one of the neat things that happens in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that we can know each other on that level. You know, it's really special. I don't think there is any place else where it, can, where it is like, like it is here. Uh, <laughs> I heard one guy said, oh, him again. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, so there are a few guys that are little rebels here. There is, you know, there's a few people standing in the back we have seats all around here. It's just like if I don't like the son of a bitch, I leave, you know. I <laughs> I don't think I'm too presumptuous. If I would say that some of us here tonight sit with a bunch of burdens and lots of if onlys. But be that as it may, we all here in these rooms are still the lucky ones because we have a chance. Lots of people have this thing called alcoholism doesn't have a chance, and for various reasons. For the record, my grandfather died from alcoholic delirium in 1910. He lived in a 2,000-acre place outside of Stockholm, and that's what happened to him. My father had problems with his liver in 1927. And nobody knew anything about this illness then. He was a giant of a man. He radiated vitality. Women adored him and men envied him. But he died three years later, and he only weighed 130 pounds when he died, and he didn't want to die at all, and he didn't have much of a chance. I was eight years old then. And it is something to see a beautiful human being like he once was. You know, he was six foot two, when he touched you, you realize his strength. But in three years, he had deteriorated to absolutely nothingness. And I like to make a point when it comes to my father. I hear from time to time from these podiums these days that some of us blame our parents for our own alcoholism. I don't share that opinion. I really became an alcoholic because I drank alcohol myself. <laughs> <laughs> My father was an aristocrat. He was very vain, very proud, very arrogant. But he was also a very loving person. But I was in violence, and that's what I would like to address. You and I are the lucky ones. We have a program that deals with injustices on both sides of the aisle, theirs and ours. 
And wouldn't that be rather sad after we come in here and find this beautiful way to live that we still will pin it on somebody else? I know this statement doesn't make some people happy because some of us like to hang on to that goddamn thing. <laughs> I love Michael Caine's line when somebody said to him, hey, have a nice day, and he said, no, I have other plans. You know? <laughs> The point I'm making is simply this, that thanks to this program, I have been able to forgive my father for the violence that was on a few occasions, okay? My older brother didn't have much of a chance for another reason. He had a little bit of pride, and it seems to be a commodity that we can't afford a luxury of this outfit. Twenty years ago now, so he lived in a castle outside Stockholm. He was married to a very beautiful girl. <laughs> in fact, he married my girlfriend. <laughs> I had a little bit of problem with that for a while. <laughs> now I'm glad he did. <laughs> he drank like I drank, and he blew it all. For 18 years, he defended his right to drink. It is something to see this insidious denial that some of us have. You know, he was a guy that earned 150 grand a year, spoke six languages fluently, carried a Swedish flag in the Olympics on three occasions. For 18 years, he lived in a little room that cost 15 bucks a month to live in, drank a fifth of whiskey every night and just lived in the past. And there was nothing ever wrong with him. And he finally died three years ago in October, you know from Yellow Yonders, and that's what happened to him. I tried to 12-step him one time. In fact, three times. I, I wrote him, his strong log and mine was very similar. I wrote him a page and a half about what I used to be like. I wrote three and a half pages about all the wonders that has happened to me since I joined the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got a postcard back. <laughs> <laughs> It said, Dear John, I'm sorry to hear about all your problems. <laughs> <laughs> I flew home to him to Stockholm and spent a few days with him. And, uh, you know, here I've been sitting at that time for a lot of years in that little room. And, uh, you know, I, he was so capable. I said, The whole world is waiting for you out there. Why don't you get going again? And he <laughs> smiled and said, you don't understand, I'm a very humble person. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't help a guy like that. That's arrogance, you know, to the highest degree. He was out and spent a month with me here in California, you know. I took him to meetings. That's how it is. That's alcoholism. My younger brother is very similar. Nine, ten years ago now, he was told by his doctor he couldn't drink alcohol anymore because there was something wrong with his liver. And he talked to him about it for 90 days. He said, Carl, you can't drink that booze anymore. But he doesn't drink the way I did, and that's what he was looking at. He has seven, eight whiskeys before dinner, two kinds of wine, coffee and brandy for dessert. It's kind of elegant. <laughs> he even likes a couple of candles now and then, you know. <laughs> It looked just like the commercial. <laughs> it's really bullshit the whole day. It really is. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, we can sit there and we can say, well, what's wrong with my brother? Nothing. Alcohol did something for my older brother the day he died. It is still doing something with my younger brother, and that's the nature of the illness. And that's why I said in the beginning, you and I are the lucky ones because we have a chance because of the evidences in these rooms that people like you and I, the way we drank and carried on, that we can change and live without it and have fabulous life. And that's what I think Alcoholics Anonymous program is all about, how to live up good out there without it. Sometimes we wonder how serious is this business. The American Medical Association has a survey out. Nine out of ten alcoholics never make it. Nine out of ten alcoholics either die or are crazy from this illness. And I hope to God that you and I are here tonight is the one out of ten that's going to make it. And it seems to me that the people who go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and submit to this program and help other alcoholics, we seem to stay sober. 
And that's what these rooms are all about. I'd like to say one thing in between here. You know, I have had a great fortune of growing up in a group in Laguna Beach with a lot of old-timers. 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 41, and 42 years of sobriety. And you and I who are young on the program, we owe those old people, guys and girls, a lot because when they came in, this was not a sure thing. Perhaps it would work. Maybe. It was an illusion. It was a hope. But thanks to those guys and girls' dedication, you and I, we have something here that's a fact and reality that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works. And you and I, let us give those old timers a hand, okay? <laughs> I talk to newcomers. I love newcomers. I like the feelings in these rooms when they're newcomers. I like being a newcomer myself. It's very important to me. And I'd like to share with you why I like to be a newcomer. I hope I never forget the last year I drank because I compromised on everything I believed in and stood for. I couldn't live a function without liquor. I didn't dare to go to sleep if I didn't have a fifth of whiskey and a refrigerator because I had to have it when I woke up. And if I ran out of booze at midnight, I usually called an associate of mine in Baldwin Park and said, Harold, next week... You will owe me $150 on this particular job, but if you give me 20 bucks tonight, you won't have to pay me the 130 next week. And I drove a 100 mile round trip at midnight to pick up $20. I didn't dare to buy any booze in Baldwin Park because then I wouldn't make it home. And when I came home to Anaheim, where we lived at the time, I bought a fifth of Imperial Bourbon for 485 And then I was safe, and I had to live like that, and I hope I never forget that period in my life. I know some of us, after we get a little well, <laughs> get a few dollars in our pockets and bedroom privileges again. <laughs> we forget how it really was. In fact, Karen cut me off six months before I came into AA. <laughs> she really ran out of humor out at the end, I tell you. <laughs> She stood and looked at me one evening and said, Jan, I wish you could find yourself a girlfriend so I wouldn't have to fool with you. <laughs> she said, you take forever. <laughs> I have to sobriety to take forever. It's very commendable. <laughs> It really ain't fair. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, I was very sensitive those days, you know. The other reason why I like to be in here, I've been going to meetings every day for 90 days since Phil Petty talked one Sunday morning. And he stood up here and said, if you keep going to meetings, you will wake up one morning and realize and find out you can function without alcohol. And it is not necessary to drink anymore and you have a way to go. And I sat in that room and I said, my God, I've experienced those feelings. And it was the first time here it dawned on me that I wasn't hooked anymore. That I had some degree of choice over my own actions. And I had already started to experience a freedom here that I hadn't had for a long, long time. And I hope I never forget the period in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> the knowledge that I wasn't hooked and that I was free and I hope I never take it for granted. Those are the two reasons why I like to be a newcomer. I didn't start to drink until I was 31 years old. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound very promising right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I, but I'd like to tell you a little bit how I was when I was young. First of all, the reason why I didn't drink when I was young. When my father died, I promised my grandmother I was never going to drink, so I didn't drink. When I was 19 years old, I had gone to college a year. The war broke out. I went in the Air Force for two and a half years. And after that, I went back to college for a year and a half. <clears throat> and I was sailing at night, and I was trying to help my mom. It was very important to me to play like the man of the house. And My older brother, you see, was different. He was brilliant in school. He had scholarships to universities and everything. It was mapped out for him. But I was different. And I could never figure him and me out in the first place. You know, that guy, he never opened a book. He had ace and everything. 
I could study to one in the morning. I still failed. Yeah. It really is something, you know. I am so sincere. I try so hard. I can be good for a short time, and then the bottom falls out, you know. And then, and I really was a screw up. When I was young, I had an unbelievable inferiority complex. I'm a perfectionist on top of it, and that's not a good combination. <laughs> I contemplated suicide a lot because I knew if I died I would be my father. And when he lived, I was security and strength and prestige and respect and all that goes with that. And I tell you what I did when I was young. I just faked it. I pretended I was really together. I was very noisy and opinionated. And that gave me some false courage. And that's how I was when I was young. When I was 31 years old, I was employed by this door factory in Alhambra. My boss was alcoholic, and he taught me how to drink every day, and a new life began for me. You know, we had early times at 8 o'clock in the morning, cocktails at 10, martini lunches from 12 to 2.30, <laughs> made a couple of calls in the afternoon and went back to the office and typed up speeds from 6 to midnight and drank whiskey. And I thought I landed in heaven. I used to come home to Karen and say, you know, this building business is out of this world. <laughs> I said, I never felt so good in my life. You know. And I tell you something. <clears throat> From day one when I started to drink, I drank 50 whiskey a day. For two years I was never drunk, never hung over. I just felt good. You know, it's incredible. I could consume that much liquor. And it was really marvelous. You know, I, my emotional things, it was like they had never existed. I couldn't miss. The sky was the limit. And that's how it was for me for two years. And then it started giving me a little trouble. The only problem the, the company had, they lost money every month. <laughs> my boss and I, we used to have those alcoholic dialogues at midnight when we were both brilliant. <laughs> He used to sit down and look at his profit and loss statement, and one night he said, I wish I could sell this outfit. Instead, I would buy an automobile dealership here. And, and I said, what do you know about the automobile business? He said, man, I've been driving for years. <laughs> you know. I said, yes, he's a good driver, you know. In fact, I love that alcoholic line about attitude, about the guy that drove down the road 80... 90 miles an hour, rolled the car six times, got up on the other side and said, never again am I going to buy a goddamn Chevy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> However, when I had been at that place for a year, I had sold so many doors they couldn't pay me my commission, so they gave me one-third of the stock of the company, so now I own the place. When you own a place, you're general manager, sales manager, and truck driver. You do everything, and I did I tell you, I worked seven days a week, 16, 18 hours a day, and loved every minute of it, you know. And now what I'm do, going to do, I'm going to give you the highlight of my drinking career. We lived in Corona del Mar at the time. It's a little beautiful town on the coast. We had our little plant up on, in Alhambra on Palm Avenue. And I had landed a big contract with American Housing Guild in San Diego. I was supposed to deliver 7,000 open in 90 days, and... And I used to come home 3.30 in the morning, truckload of doors that should be delivered before 8 in the morning in San Diego. And Karen had a hot bath ready for me. <laughs> and I slid in the top there and lit a camel and inhaled, you know, and she laid back there, you know. And, and she came in with a pitch of martinis and sat down and drank martinis with me. I mean, that's really living, you know. 3.30 in the morning, you lay down in the tub and smoke that camel and drink that martini and spit out the pimenta, you know. <laughs> you know, and, uh, <laughs> and then I usually said, you know, I'm just a little immigrant and I own the goddamn place, you know. <laughs> a few years later, they fired me from my own door factory. When I became the owner of the place, there were 60,000 in the hole. I signed a piece of paper and endeared to myself 20 grand overnight, and I thought I had a good deal. <laughs> when I took my inventory in Alcoholics Anonymous, I realized that optimism was one of my defects of character. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> I 
We have three beautiful girls on the Sunday, and we took them to church on Sundays. We did everything right to be Americans. The only problem with that church business was the last four years I drank. I was a morning drinker. She usually inspected me before we should leave, and many times she just looked at me and said, Not today. And I hurt my feelings. And she took off down the street with the kids in the car, and I had to stand there in the corner at home. So sometimes I ran down the block after her, screaming and hollering, you know. <laughs> and my neighbors were out there talking about the lawn problem, and here I came running by. And <laughs> Sometimes I was strangely clad. <laughs> <laughs> she saw me in the rear of your mirror coming after her there in my pajamas, you know. So stopped down the block and waited for me, I rolled down the window and said, What's the matter now? You know. I said, Don't forget to pray for me, you know. <laughs> I got there, I didn't feel like I belonged to fit in, but I tried and I sat down and looked sincere and hummed a lot, you know. I could take the sermon about 20 minutes max, and then I have a drink. 20 minutes into his talk, I just got up and said, Oh, screw him all. And then I went home, and I drank like Grand Scotch those days and played good music and became very spiritual. Played Stan Getz and Dave Brubeck and La Boheme and Coleman Hawk and stuff like that. Seems like I graduated now to Plink Freud and Brian Ferry and... <laughs> <laughs> and I need the baker. I don't know what's happening to me. A <laughs> couple of years later, it had progressed a little bit. One week, she said, let us try the Episcopalian church next Sunday, because the congregation certainly doesn't do the job. And I said, it sounds terrific. She said, yeah. They have very colorful costumes down there. They sing a lot, and you like music. It might hit you. I'd been drinking to five that morning. I still had a shake, so I went out in the kitchen and drank a little codeine cough medicine and two shots of bourbon to stop the shakes, tightened my belt and walked on with small steps and tried to look effective and passed inspection and came to church. The only thing I can say to you, the routine in the Episcopalian church, it really ain't for drunks. It's a very busy place. <laughs> I mean, they get up and down and kneel and pray and sit and stand and sing. I was up and down three, four times, and my timing got off. <laughs> <laughs> when they sat down, I stood up. You know. In Sweden, when we don't know the words, we sing tralala. <laughs> I had a couple of solos there all by myself. <laughs> In fact, the second time I came up there and gave that little trial of law, you could hear a guy five rows behind me. He said, sit down, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Third time down praying, I couldn't get up again. I clung to that bench. I tried every trick in the book I knew get up and couldn't make it. I tried it sideways and backwards and forward. I even tried to roll up. <laughs> And she sat down and looked at me, and she said, For God's sake, Johnny, get up. And I said, It's an absolute impossibility. <laughs> so they went up and down, and I sat down and sang by myself. And uh, <laughs> Next time I looked behind me, they all don't pay him. And here's this guy in the road behind me. He's laying down his knees with his chin in his hand, and he mumbled and looked real serious. And he looked right at me. And I sat down and stared at him. Uh, you know, sometimes you look at the guy you focus in and you lock and you can't move, you know. <laughs> and he stared at me and I stared at him and then I thought I better look a little casual, so I winked my eye to him. <laughs> <laughs> kind of stopped him for a minute. <laughs> so we didn't go back to the Episcopalian church. Huh? I don't think alcoholics like me or drunks like me really have any problem with booze until we try to stop drinking. And when I started to try to stop drinking, I got into trouble with my liquor. One week she said, you know, you drink too much. I said, what are you talking about? She said, Johnny, you drink way too much. So I said, well, then I quit. And then I couldn't quit. And that's when it all began. When I had been off the sauce for a couple of days, I had the shakes. And then two shots of whiskey stopped the shakes. I could function and work. So then I had to count myself into where I had to have a couple of drinks all the time. 
And then I saw the lie about, and then I was hiding, and from then on it got worse. Two years into my drinking, I had three years or so, I was up to two-fifths of whiskey a day. The last year I drank, the last ten months I drank, I drank two and three-fifths of whiskey a day, two small bottles of codeine cough medicine every day, and six anisins four times a day, and I was absolutely weird, you know? <laughs> I couldn't get drunk, I couldn't get sober, the guilt was on all the time, there was no relief from it whatsoever, and I just thought I was going crazy, and I probably was. You know, it's a terrifying time. We hear sometimes on these podiums about the alcoholic loneliness, and as far as I'm concerned, I ain't anything like it, because it is a total isolation, and we drink to live and we know we are dying, there's no way out of it, and that's how it is. Two years after the shakes began, weird things happened to me when I stopped drinking. One morning at four o'clock, I sat in my bed and looked in front of me, and this big white snake came out of the wall. I never saw anything like in my life, unbelievable. He came right out of the wall. He was snow white, had three black eyes. He was this big in diameter on his fattest part, and he was 23 feet long. <laughs> you know, and he came slowly across the room, stopped right in front of my face and started to hiss at me. This is like this tongue dangling, you know. And I sat there paralyzed from fright staring at the goddamn thing. I could even smell him. It was kind of a pro high sweet mortuary deal. The whole thing was incredible. And I sat down. I was thinking, you know, I haven't had a drink for three days, so it can't be the booze. <laughs> <laughs> I screamed so loud from fright that my brain exploded from my own sound and I fell backwards unconscious. That was my experience with it. You want to say something? <laughs> oh. I thought it was important. <laughs> there were some lights on outside, you know. <laughs> oh, registration is 1095 as of 8 o'clock. I don't scare you. <laughs> you know that when he came close, the noise in my head that I, for my own scream, so was so unbelievably loud that he just blew like a balloon. He had pew, and then I fell backwards unconscious. That was my experience with him. My wife told me in the morning. She said something strange happened this morning around four o'clock. She said, you sat straight up, looked in front of you for quite a while, and then you said, <laughs> One morning she almost had me. I woke up and my bed was wet. It was the most humiliating time in my drinking career. You know, I, I lay down and I thought, it has finally happened, and what can I say to this? And she was standing in front of the bed and looking at me with those cold island on eyes, you know. <laughs> you know those little bitty ones? You know? <laughs> the dialogue was terrific, though. She stood on and looked at me, she said, well... And I laid out, well, what? I mean, what the hell can you say? Huh? God, I hope there's some bad weather here tonight. <laughs> you no, know I felt. In that moment, my youngest daughter, Katrina, came in and she said, Dad, I'm so sorry, but last night, when I climbed into bed with you, I believed I wrecked your bed. <laughs> I mean, talk about the break for an alcoholic. <laughs> I just smiled at us. Oh, my little darling, that's a little squirt now and then won't hurt anybody. <laughs> And you thought I was alcoholic, <laughs> you know. Four days later, it wasn't Katrina's fault. I didn't have a dream that I went to the bathroom. I didn't have a blackout. I just laid on reason. I said, that's a hell with it. If she can do it, I can do it, you know. <laughs> and that's what I had become at that time of my life. And today I'm very grateful I'm just a simple alcoholic. Because we have these evidences of self-degradation. And I believe this, that God will let us see us how we really are later on. 
And perhaps then there will be enough panic in us that we seek help. And some of us will have the great fortune of finding the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and a way to live. One night I'd may love to her when she wasn't even there, and that's kind of tricky. <laughs> she was laying two feet away from me there, and uh, she said, What are you doing over there? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, I beg your pardon. You know, <laughs> I always had a lot of class, you know what I mean? <laughs> and when she realized what was going on, she started to laugh at me. And I started to cry because I felt it was so humiliating to laugh at the guy who was doing his best. <laughs> in the morning, I had been out in the kitchen and had my codeine cough medicine, my whiskey, and she met me in the hallway. And she said, well, good morning, lover boy. <laughs> I didn't feel any pain. I just smiled. <laughs> so that's the best piece I've had in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I love laughter in Alcoholics Anonymous. To me, it is a spiritual experience. To me, it's very much part of the recovery program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Anything that you and I have laughed a little bit about tonight was absolutely the deepest tragedy when it happened. But when you and I, in this man of identification, when it comes to this insanity, this denial, can just laugh about the whole damn mess. It makes it possible for us to forgive ourselves and change. And it is very much part of the recovery program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Our story, like everybody else's, was sad before I came in here. We started over many times, and every time I had the best of intention, and every time it got worse. One time we should go to Palm Springs and start over again. I was in a wagon for three weeks. You know, I hadn't been out of town for five years at that time. I didn't dare to leave because I was safe there. They took my checks and they weren't always good, but I had a charge account that I was party paying for, so I always got what I needed as far as liquor was concerned. And that morning we should go to Palm Springs. I couldn't handle it. And I drank a fifth before we left and drove 89 miles an hour to Palm Springs. The kids were crying. She was hysterical, and I had to get there while it lasted. And she was convinced it was my way of telling her I didn't love her anymore and wandered out of it and didn't know how to say it. And the second day there, she just locked herself in the bathroom and drank kind of aspirin on her. Said, I can't live like this any longer. I'm going to commit suicide. And I laid in that bed and prayed to God, hoping she was going to die so she didn't have to be with me anymore. Because I knew at that time of my life there was no way out of it for me because I had tried many times, several times, sincerely. And every time I ended up the same way as I was. Two years after that incident, I came into AA. And you can draw your own conclusion how those two years were and my guilt connected with it. That was the same year they fired me from my door factory. And you should have seen my attitude about that. I mean, now, this is my means of income. And they said, sign off. And I just signed off. I said, who needs this heading anyhow? Now, can you drink and be happy? And that's how it goes. He'll take everything that's near and dear to us. <clears throat> Two days before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was picked up down at Trifty Mart on Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, trying to steal a pint of liquor for 3.57. Now, you should have seen me that morning. I was drunk and unshaven. I weighed 246 pounds. I couldn't even defend myself. I just stood on wind, but it can't be me, you know. Look where I came from. I was brought up in a beautiful family under the most favorable circumstances, but that morning in Anaheim I looked exactly like a person who has to steal a pint of liquor to live. I had an ultimatum that night and got off the sauce. I had an appointment the next day with a big developer, and I had the shakes bad, and I went into my little ball around my office for four years to have a couple of shots so I could function and see this guy, and two drinks didn't do it anymore. I had eight or more, and I knew I had had too much, and I didn't have to blow that job, too. And I sat out there in the parking lot in my car at 2.30 in the afternoon, and I just wept. <laughs> I said, God, what has happened to me? What has happened to us? I had the most fabulous plans. You know, help me or let me die soon. I just can't hack it much longer. 
And the next day, Karen stood on and looked at me, and she said, You know, for years, because of the children, we have stayed together. But now, because of them, we have to part. And either you go down and try that thing called Alcoholics Anonymous, or else out you go again. And that's how I came in. And I didn't think this would work either. Those last four years I drank, there wasn't anything I hadn't tried to use to stop sacred things to me. You know, I had 13 years, two hours a day of religious education when I grew up. I swore on the Bible in front of my wife and kids one time. You know, I said to Karen, I said, I swear to God I'm never going to drink again. I said, I've never broken my word of honor to you. And she said, you know, children, your father never has. And I hadn't. And I thought if I use this thing that means so much to me, maybe I can stop. And two weeks later, I find myself drunk again. I went to the minister for counseling. Every week for an hour for 18 months, and I leveled with him. And that gentleman, he said, you have to ask God to help you. I said, Walter, you don't, wait, you don't talk to your wife the way my, I talk to mine in the evenings when she corners me about my drink because God doesn't want to have anything to do with me because I know I have tried. And that gentleman, he read a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and realized that we lacked identification and that I had to find my bottom down, further down alone. So he gave up on me. When he wouldn't talk to me anymore, I went to a marriage counselor, a psychologist in Santa Ana. I spent $2,000 with this doctor. <clears throat> that wasn't anything he said to me that my wife didn't tell me for free three times a day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't anything he said to me either that wasn't the truth. Anything he said was the truth. He said one time, he said, Ackerling, you know what's wrong with you? I said, Doc, you tell me what's wrong with me. And he rattled it all up, all my secrets, all my emotional things. And I said, you are absolutely right. And that's the goddamn reason why I drink all the time, because I can't stand the way I'm put together either. So then he laid on me how I hurt my wife and my kids. So what do you do then? You do what I did. I went in the wagon. And the tragedy for us is simply this, that the more sober we become, the more we realize how we hurt our loved ones. And that in itself drives us back to drinking again, because that's the only way we know to get out from under the guilt, and so it goes. Now, there's a lot of capable people in the field of alcoholism today. I sure don't envy them, because the nature of the illness is still the same today as when I came in. As long as Bruce is doing something for us, it's really impossible for anybody talking out of using it, and that's the nature of the illness. And that's why I said in the beginning that you and I are the lucky ones because of the evidences in these rooms. Last Christmas I drank. I bought a dapper gray Arabian horse. I thought if I had a hob, I could stop drinking. I came home around 20th of December and said, you know, I only had a dapper gray Arabian. I think I could stop drinking, and, you know. <laughs> And she just looked a little strange and said, Johnny, I don't give a goddamn if you buy a Ferrari. You know what I mean? So, so I went out and bought a dapper gray Arabian horse. <laughs> I was sober with that thing for a day and a half. And then I had 14 martinis for lunch and fell off the horse, too. And so it goes. And then I come in, along at Club in Anaheim, and they said, Do you have a drinking problem? I said, No. You get along as famously with it. Can you do something for my wife? She's crazy. <laughs> You know, that's how it is when we come in here. And we don't know it's going to work, so we've got to cover our own bases. In fact, I can tell you this much. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, alcohol was not my problem. It had been my solution for so long. And we so slowly and so gradually go into our relationship to liquor, it's impossible for us to see where we are in relationship to liquor and admit it. And i tell you another thing today. If I had known how sick I was when I came in, I would never have stayed because stopping drinking wouldn't have fixed it. But I used a line in the big book that says, more will be revealed, and thank God for that thing. However, the next day it all happened to me here. You know, that morning I went up and I drank a little codeine cough medicine and drank two shots of whiskey, brushed my teeth, drove down to the Alona Club and had a pint of liquor under my car seat and drank that and came in to the club and stood down and talked to them a little bit about why I drank a little bit now and then, you know, and stuff like that. And, 
And then I went out and had lunch. I drank four more double martinis for lunch and came back to the club and asked the lady there to call my wife and say I'm here, you know. And and then I should do that for half an hour and I should just go home and buy a fifth of whiskey and tell her that I had been to three AA meetings already today to show how sincere I was, you know. <laughs> when I should leave that club to my friend and sponsor, Charlie Vick, Stanstone, he said, Come home with me and let us talk. And we sat in his patio and he told me his story. And that's what I think is important in Alcoholics Anonymous. One drunk talking to another. And the identification between the two. And when he was through with his story, I realized that he was worse than I was. And he depended more than I did on it. And he was sober. I said, you were that bad and you can stay off the sauce? And he said, yeah. <laughs> I knew he was telling the truth. But I tried to wiggle out of it one more time. I said, Charlie, you don't understand. Every time I stop drinking, I get the shakes and weird things happens to me. He said, you were only shake for four or five days. And then you never have to shake again as long as you live. And I didn't know that. I sat down and I thought, what information this guy's coming up with? <laughs> then he told me about the disease of alcoholism. He called it an allergy of the body coupled with the obsession of the mind. And he said, the first drink is a mental one to make you comfortable. And then the body takes over and craves more booze and you cannot control your drinking pattern or your behavior pattern. So things started to make a little bit of sense to me that afternoon. That evening I was in a meeting. And when they read portion of chapter 5 that we always do out there, I just said, please God help me today to stay sober. And it wasn't a big deal. You know, I always thought the spiritual experience would be something like Yes, John, what can I do for you? You know what I mean? <laughs> It wasn't like that at all. It was merely a feeling. And my thoughts were these that perhaps after all this takes away from me, too. When I came home that night, I said to Karen, I said, You know, it, it happened to me tonight. I don't have to drink anymore. And she said, Your eyes look different. I haven't had a drink of alcohol or any coating cough medicine or strange pills of funny cigarettes since that day and it, it's a 25, 26 years and one month and 25 days ago today. <laughs> and you all knew you might sit down and say to yourself it must be easy for you to have all that time on the program. But it wasn't easy then, and that's what we are dealing with right now. You know, I was not a great success when I came in here. I had a lot of anxieties about my children. I wanted to be a good father, and I knew I wasn't most of the time. I was $36,000 in the hole. They were all small bills and all due. And Karen's suicide attempt, that just about drove me crazy. It's very hard to live with yourself when you realize that you're a broken and not a human being spirit. But I didn't drink and I went to meetings. And that's all I had going for me for quite a while. But I'd like to tell you something. Those first two months of my sobriety, I couldn't handle nothing. When the phone rang at home, I just pointed at it. I said, Well, <laughs> 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 I split and hid in my closet, you know. Yeah, I looked good. I had a three-piece Brooks Butter suit on, you know. But when that damn phone rang, I just, <laughs> I just sat in down, sat on the floor and wept. I had ten days of sobriety. I sat in the stag meeting and blurted it out. You guys don't understand, but I feel so goddamn guilty. And that was an old time when I said, the reason you feel so guilty is because you're guilty. You know what I mean? <laughs> And there were guys like that that saved my life. And for the first time I could admit that it was my fault for our reservations. You know, as long as we pin it on somebody else or someone else, nothing can happen to us. But I just came to the conclusion, whatever they had done or she had done or said, I drove them to it. And when I took it on that basis, I was free. But when that meeting closed that night, it was probably the most crucial time for me here because I felt trapped. I felt I was in a corner I couldn't get out of. I actually regretted that I had copped out and admitted it was my fault. The only thing I had going for me here then was this, that I knew under no circumstances could I go back to drinking again. No matter what, I couldn't escape for booze anymore. 
I had done enough damage. I had no more rights when it came to liquor. And whatever was coming my way, I just had to plain taste the music, but I couldn't split with boots anymore. So I'd actually taken the first two steps in this program and didn't know it. But how do you turn your wheel in life over to care of God, as you understand it? What's the spiritual experience in these rooms? Well, that happened to me moments later the same evening. As I stood all alone and afraid, this guy come up to me. Never saw him before. And he just put all his arms around me and, and said, Johnny, don't worry, everything is going to be all right. And I believed him. That's the beginning. That's what the beginning of the higher power for me is when it happened. It was just like those guys had my welfare taught, and I just trusted them. For quite a while, those guys really gave me the courage to face my wrongs and my difficulties, and they talked to me in a fashion I never experienced before because they didn't point fingers and there was no judgment. They just shared their own experiences from heart to heart. And this love and this care that goes on in these rooms is really the most healing commodity that we can offer being offered. It shows us back to good health, and it gives us a God of our very own that we can trust on any condition. Here for everybody, and nobody is excluded. And we wonder sometimes, this moment of clarity, I still get the goosebumps when I hear it happening in the meeting. You know, it's, I get the goosebumps, this moment of clarity. Some people call it the spiritual experience. Some people call it the God's Eskimo that was sent our way. It's the same thing. It's decision time in AA. Am I going to grab hold and find out what those guys and girls are talking about, or should I just discard it and say, well, I'm going to do it on my own? Why is it so necessary that we do it alone when we do it so well together? And that's what these rooms are all about. I actually envy you new people what you're going to find out about yourself providing you go to meetings. I envy you what you're going to find out about yourself. And you don't believe me now, and I didn't believe it then, but it was actually the greatest opportunity I ever had in my life when I was beaten down to nothing, so don't fret it, we have all been there. You sit in an opportunity if you're throwing the towel and let us love you and help you. It's a trip and a half. Stay and find out what it's all about here, you know, it's really important. You know, this acceptance where we are right now, that's when it begins. We are where we are supposed to be right now. I don't care how bad it is and how hopeless it is. When we can accept the fact how it really is, that's when it begins. That's an opportunity. I can't for a moment believe God will let us go through all these things and then bring us in here and show us his way to live it if he didn't have any plans for us. It really wouldn't make any sense at all. You know? Jesus. You know, I uh, I like to tell you that Karen didn't believe I was going to stay sober. She didn't dare to believe it. And you know, and that's all right. You know, we get a little intimidated in the beginning. You know, and I tell you something. You and I have something here. It doesn't matter what anybody else says around us. You and I have something in these these rooms with these people. And you see, tr trust and respect is nothing that we can demand. It is something we have to earn. It's a very important thing. But think about it. I don't care how bad it is for you and me all day long when we go through this life here in sobriety. But you know, when you and I go to bed at night, yeah, but I didn't drink and I didn't use. It's the biggest deal there is for us. Don't kid yourself. And of course, we can say, I want more physic physical sobriety. Begins and ends with that. It begins and ends with it. Without it, we have nothing. And as far as spiritual growth, it's limitless. There is no ceiling on spiritual growth. 
And it's bound to happen if we stay and practice the principles. It's all laid out for us here in the program. One time she said, before you had the booze as a crutch, now you have those goddamn meetings. <laughs> Are you that kind of a weakling you can't stand on your own two feet? And I said, yes, I am that kind of a weakling. And she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to a meeting because I don't want to get drunk anymore. And that was the time when she realized that I was not on the wagon. Something had happened to me. And then she joined the program of al It's been a fabulous lover forever since. You see, you and I are strong when we can admit weakness. That's our strength and survival here. We don't have to prove nothing anymore. Because this is bigger than all of us. And that's why we have the ABCs in chapter 5. It says, God could and would if he was sought. See? We wonder, how can I wipe out that wreckage and all that bad stuff? It has nothing to do with the intentions, promises, gifts. We can't bribe them anymore. It doesn't matter how many good things you and I do, but when we come home drunk, it's all canceled out. The only amends we can make to ourselves and our loved ones is to stay off the booze a day at a time. The rest of the program will follow little by little, but we've got to start somewhere. You know, really, how simple it is. Um, long ago now, she said, it wasn't always your fault. Long ago now, she said, you know, this life we live today is really just the most fabulous adventure. It was so hopeless and tragic at one time, it's completely turned around. There's even a degree of innocence between us today. And that has come to pass because she is just as busy in Alan and as I'm in AA. We have seen so many people over the years have turned around, started to be good to one another. Nothing is in vain here. And um, I'd like to talk about the inventory. You know, that's uh, sometimes we... I didn't want to take my inventory. I didn't think it would make a damn bit of difference. I was afraid. And Charlie said I had to if I wanted to stay sober. And you are, if you sit down and wonder about, should I take it or shouldn't I? Or how do I do it? You know there's a long form and a short form. Hmm. I'll give you a little help. First write down the four things you have decided not to tell anybody, even under severe torture. <laughs> 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 You'll save you 62 pages of writing, you know. <laughs> you gotta, you got to get through it. Otherwise, it ain't right and you know it, you know. And I, I sense in this room that there's a lot of sponsorship here, and that's the beautiful thing. And you know, I tell you the strange thing to me, I thought it wouldn't do nothing for me. But it, it did. It was just like I had fulfilled a contract for sobriety. I never had to worry about it again, whether I had to drink or not. I really sensed and felt that God had forgiven me. And I realized another thing through the inventory that I had made the same mistakes and errors in the same areas of my life throughout my life. When I was 12, 13, 17, 18, 21, 22, 31, 32, same areas throughout my life. And I realized that these must be my defects of character and shortcomings. And I went down on my knees and said, God, I have denied myself all my life that I am like this. And I realized now through my own technique and willpower I cannot do anything about them. And therefore, I'll give them to you, and you can take them away on your time and your terms. And the thing starts to fall in place for us. You know that it's a funny deal. You know that when I came in in the same area a couple of months later, instead of them, them this time I'm going to prove to them that I can do it. You know. Instead, I called a friend in the or my sponsor, said, "What do you do when you're about doing this?" And he said, well, I tried it this way. It, wasn't so, well, it didn't work so good. I did it this way, and it worked better. And I just thought, well, the way I was going to tackle it is more sophisticated. <laughs> well, you know, it, I tried it his way, and it worked better. And you know what happens is really this. Those obsession we have to prove something. When we surrender that self and ego that happens to us with the 12 steps in the program, it's not an obsession anymore. 
all the things that we want to have or would like to become or be happens to us but not because we have an obsession and insisting on it it will become a friend's benefit it's given to us as freely as the sobriety is the gift of God and the grace of God it's the something else I have gone to the first year I went to seven meetings a week for all these years I have gone to five meetings a week yeah. seems to be a lot of meetings I'm up early every morning I'm late to bed I work very hard that's a privilege as far as I'm concerned you know it's a heavy schedule but I tell you something you know I live more normal than normal people do <laughs> the only difference I'm aware of it you know, yeah. you know it is something special that guys like and girls like us that because of this that we can live and function like a normal human being out there you know, it is something special that we all have to do that you know the last four years I drank you know I so help me God I work all those hours seven days a week I do deliver something so I could collect invoice something so I could let, collect something so I could keep this routine going all the time that's what I did the last four years I drank Carolyn and Claudia were 13 and 10 when I came in I played tennis with them twice a week for 10 years where they grew up they, I taught them how to ride a horse I fell off they had him for 10 years I relieved my youth with those two kids it's a beautiful thing my two young ones can't even remember me drunk or drinking Katrina very little Johnny not at all they were that young when I came in I have experienced everything with them that I wish my father could have experienced with me and it is just like I've sensed his presence all along here on this journey you know it's just a different kind of a communication there's no mystery anymore it's a beautiful thing and the strange thing is that Katrina and John had more problems in their lives than, than the other two ain't that something Katrina had the same personality as I had a desperate need of approval and never feeling she was enough contemplated suicide since she was 14 but she has been in Alana for 13 years now yeah <laughs> she had the, the 27th of July this year she had four years of sobriety <laughs> you know she said she called me the dad it was 11 o'clock at night and I sat there like in total degradation and I realized I drank every day and I was thinking about my uncle now I can sit there and deny myself that I don't have a problem with it, none of them have my right to drink and I would blow my marriage I would lose my little son that ain't even born yet she was pregnant at the time and she said I went to the phone and called a girl in AA and said this is Katrina I drink every day will you, will you help me and she hasn't had a drink since and she's beautiful and free my son was hooked on drugs and pot for four years he sat on that hill in Laguna and got stoned every night from 8 to midnight first of May this year nine years being off the drugs and pot you know yeah. <laughs> he's beautiful and he's a gentleman and uh, we were together last night and we had such a wonderful time he lives in Scottsdale where he came out to us on Thanksgiving you know it's hard for us when it comes to the kids but thanks to you, I never had to give them ultimatum that involved total ejection. I could always leave the door open. Didn't have to be any power play. So I, I just tell, thought to myself, well, I have been humiliated by experts, for God's sake, you know. So <laughs> it was a big deal for me when I was right and didn't have to say nothing. It was even a bigger deal when I could give everybody else the right to be wrong. I didn't have to interfere in God's timetable. It's a beautiful thing, that life. You know, it really is. And uh, to see them now, and incredible. Now I'm going to... One thing more. Our biggest deal we have here that is resentment. And uh, that's our number one killer here. 
this program and we can't afford a lecture over resentment. And, uh, you know, I had a little bit of resentment against my wife and my younger brother, but they were easy because I loved them both. But my older brother was different because he was the reason for all my emotional problems. And I tell you, when we grew up, he was just a year and nine months older than I was. But he hated me with a passion, and I could never understand what was wrong between us. You know, when he was 12 years old, he was... He weighed over 200 pounds. He was six foot four. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and uh, he used to knock me out, and I flew under the dining room table to pretend that I was knocked out. And I really wasn't. I just didn't want him to hit me anymore. You know. And I tell you, I didn't feel much like a man because I should stand up, but I was no match for him. <coughs> and he... He drowned me when I was 13 years old. He was a polo player. In fact, he was in the Olympics as a water polo player. Swedish team. And uh, we were out at 15 foot depth in the ocean. And, and he grabbed me and held me under until I heard my father's voice talking to me. And it's a terrifying thing to drown. I was just suspended underneath. Couldn't even move my limbs anymore. My father's voice talked to me from the other side, you know. When I came through, he had dragged me up and laid me on the sun deck. And I, and I laid on, <laughs> what's the matter with him? I just want him to tolerate me. And, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, and I mean, he, he was something else. And then I, they told me that I had to forgive him. <laughs> I thought, how can I forgive the son of a bitch? <laughs> you know, I mean, am I some sort of a second-class citizen because I have joined Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, I've got to be something more to this than this. Say, I forgive you. I didn't feel, I felt phony. And I asked for direction. I tried the serenity player, and I, I said, God, I've got to be something else. And then one guy said, try to understand your resentment. And then I turned it around. I said, why did he resent me? And it was just like, and not a ball game, you know. And I, it just came like, I could see it so clearly. But it was between us when I was three and he was five. Our father favored me. That was the whole deal. My father used to lift me up and hug me and kiss me. <laughs> Believe me, I was an adorable baby. <laughs> <laughs> and he was obese. And he was not the lap baby. You know what I mean? And he, I could see his eyes when he stood next to us. What about me? And I, you know, and I, that's the whole deal. And, you know, he's such an improver. And he needed more love than I did. And I was in the way. And I just thought, how can I set this record straight between us? So he knows that I have no problem with all the things that, went, that we went through together here. Or that's, I, 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 I actually felt I have to make some amends to him that I was in, in the way. And I realized, you know, you can call this what you want. You know, I haven't heard from him for 15 years at this time in my life. You know, we are both over 40 years old. The next day I got a long letter from him. What do you think about that? And he rattled up everything that he has achieved and done throughout his life. You know. And he said, do you remember when we were little and I talked about our father to glorify his memory and all that thing. And you know, when he went through junior high school and high school, he took gymnastics seven days a week, and he had everything against him. Six foot four and tremendously obese and things like that, you know. And he took gymnastics. He became an officer and a gentleman. He carried a Swedish flag in the Olympics on three occasions. And uh, he lived in this beautiful castle house of Stockholm like, like my father grew up. And I realized then that <laughs> he's still obsessed with trying to get the approval from our father, and he died when he was nine, and he can't get it. He lived his whole life for this. So you say, Jesus, you're t you know what I did? I just wrote, wrote this little line. I said, dear Bartha, if our father would have been alive today, he would have taken you in his arms and said, you have succeeded beyond my greatest expectations, your loving brother, John. And I haven't had a resentment since. But you know what the payoff is on this? 
I lost my inferiority complex. It is incredible what happens to us when we, we take these steps that they talk about that sound so corny at times, you know, and we get ourselves out of the way. I love this thing in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that we share our experiences and our experiences only. And if anything at all happens to us with a little longevity on the program, it simply is that we get a little bit more of understanding for other human beings. We don't have to be so zeroed in on ourselves all the time. It's a beautiful thing. Now, I, I'm going to wrap this thing up. I know <laughs> we, we can't go overtime in AA. It drives these old timers crazy, you know. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and uh, I have a friend in Glendale. His name is Bob Lemkin. He's a full blooded German. And I had a little problem with the Germans going into war. <laughs> you know, I really had a problem with them. And uh, after four years, I realized I loved this Bob Lemkin, you know. He even talks funny. <laughs> he was born in this country, but he has more of an accent than I have. I can't figure it out. He must practice every night something. But you know, for the last 15 years, Bob has invited me to Glendale to talk on his birthday. I mean, realize it. He invites me there. But he's one of these towns, old timers, who say that you can't so save any souls after 10. You know what I mean? So here it was 10 o'clock, I had a minute and a half to wrap up my story. And he sits back down and he shouts, John, for God's sake, it's 10. I said, Lemke, this is only an AA meeting. We ain't marching into Poland tonight, you know. (laughs) (laughs) I tell you, I, I... when I, the first two years or so, when I 12 stepped to German, I, I wasn't very nice. <laughs> I usually said, uh, I said, don't rush into this thing, it's so good out there, you know. <laughs> I, wa- I wanted them to suffer a little longer, you know. <laughs> And there was another guy, and he was Bill Schellenberger. He was also a German. He sobered up in Anaheim where I did, and, and he was a framing contractor. And, and uh, I want to tell you this little episode, and then I'm going to sit down. You know, I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the thing in the beginning where it says, alcohol is a mere symptom of something deeper seated emotional. It covers a lot of ground. I love the first in the big book that says we are 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. It's a beautiful promise there. But the fellowship have a lot to do in the beginning because it takes a little while before all those things fall in place, you know. The big book and sponsorship and so on and before all the steps fall in place. But the fellowship has a special thing for us that I'm going to cover. This Bill Schellenberger, he was framing 110 houses in Mission Viejo for a gentleman named Alva Wilson. He was a 70-year-old gentleman, a developer that built about 2,000 homes a year. And uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and I went out to see what my guys were doing. And when I come out there, it was in July, it was 84 degrees hot, and Bill is up on the second floor down nailing on roof rafters, you know. And he was a good-looking guy. You know, he was six foot two. He had a red handkerchief around his forehead, no T-shirt, shorty shorts on, you know, and a big belt and a big hammer, 30-foot tape and construction boots, you know. And he is swinging up down that roof, you know, and hammering away. And he saw me coming down the street, and he screamed. And there was then Mr. Wilson and six vice presidents coming down the color sack. And <laughs> And Bill says, John! And he leaped from that roof. And he just jumped right out to that roof, down in the dirt, out of smoke, just flying, and he threw himself around me and kissed me twice, you know. I mean, here we are, two big guys in a construction job, you know. Oh, Jesus Christ, you know, we saved this one, God damn it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's incredible, really, you know. You know and, and Mr. Wilson stood out and looked at us and he said, 
what's going on with you guys, you know? And Bill said, oh, Mr. Wilson, old John and I went through Alcatraz together. <laughs> 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 and he knew better. He stood on, he looked, and he was really serious. And he had tears in his eyes, and he said, no, I don't think so. But whatever it is, it's beautiful. And that's the fellowship. That's what goes on in these rooms. Chuck C., when he lived amongst us all those years, he was trying to show us what's going on in these rooms. It's called Love With No Conditions. Love With No Conditions. You and I can be who we are and what we are, and in spite of it, we are loved. There's nothing like it on the face of this earth. And then, you know, due to the fact that this isn't that you and I have, we belong. We belong to each other. There's a sense of belonging in these rooms at times is absolutely haunting. It's a fact and reality. Alone we cannot do it, but together we can. And that's where the fellowship comes in. They'll carry us when we can't care for ourselves. They just put the arms around us and everything's going to be all right. <laughs> and that's and there's nothing like it. I like to say that when I was 13 years old, I used to sit and look out over the ocean in Sweden. I had intentions and anticipations and dreams. I'm 67 years old now, and I look out over the ocean in Laguna Beach every day. And I have intentions and anticipations and dreams, and I'm ex extremely vulnerable. And I thank God every day for this sensitiveness that you and I have. This sensitiveness, it's a blessing because it is a thermostat, because it motivates us to take the action laid out in the, that's laid out in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. The action. Chuck used to say we can't think ourselves into good living. We, we have to live ourselves into good thinking. It's the action we take. And you know, we wonder sometimes, what's the formula for how to change of attitude in this program? You know. And thank God for this no profundity this. You know, when you I, I've met many spiritual people, beautiful people, professionally beautiful spiritual people. Two things bothers all of us. It's either what we do or what we don't do. <laughs> it's, it's almost asinine when you look at it. If it is something that I do that bothers me, I have to stop it. If it is something I don't do, they, we call it procrastination. I have to attend to it. Otherwise, I'm going to magnify that out of proportion. Ain't that something else? <laughs> <laughs> Every afternoon, most year around, I go down to the beach where I live and swim for half an hour. That's the time of the day when I'm alone. That's the time of the day when I look over my life and my priorities. It's the time of the day when I have the most intimate privacy. You call it the tenth, and, and I call it the tenth and eleventh step. And I cannot but realize the miracle of this program of all is that we can live without alcohol. That's really the miracle of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, when we put down no conditions in our sobriety, when we have no reservations about the twelve steps and the twelve traditions, this way of life that's laid out for us, and we practice these principles in all of our affairs, what happens to us then is really this, that we men and women can live out there in that world where the conflicts are, where we used to be getting trouble, and we will fit in there, and we will be part of it. We can really be like God's kids, like we were intended to be in the first place. Think about that. Any other therapy pertaining to this series of illness of ours, people are usually confined behind doors and walls and locks and bars. It ain't in jail we have a problem with liquor. It's not in the institutions and the care units because we cannot remain in there forever. Eventually we have to go out in the mainstream of life and living, and that's what this is all about. And when we start to live and lead lives so we don't have to justify our own actions, we can really take these strong feelings and emotions we have within ourselves and turn it all into positive. And I know for a fact there is a lot more good stuff and they're bad, and if that ain't the payoff, I don't know what it is. If I have said nothing tonight that can identify, we'll just go to another meeting tomorrow. <laughs> but, 
But if you will believe this and take this with you when you leave this place tonight, and if you're a little bit like I was when I first came in, I woke up with two things every morning. It was loneliness and fear. If you can just believe this, that we only wish you well and we only want good things for you, if you can just believe that and take that with you, you will never wake up lonely anymore. Because you know by now there is a way to go and to live, and God bless you and thank you.